He's smiling. I think that now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I always get a little nervous at this point. Right. Me too, but we're live. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, start the countdown clock here. Yeah. Set it to nine minutes. If okay. He's smiling. I think that now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, I always get right. a little nervous. Got to turn point. that off. Right. Me too, but we're live. There it goes. Okay. Got it. And I can hear it. I can hear as well. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> the echo is gone and people are joining us. They will be able to, I guess Emmy has said this already, but the people who log in early now will hear everything that we say. And they'll see the little thumbnails as well. So I have uh, Christopher's bio here, Emmy, and I thought I'd uh, do a little introduction for our viewers. That sounds great. It occurred to me, Christopher, when I was thinking about your uh, book that I have yes. to hold mm -hmm. up, you are something of a prophet. Yeah, that's, that's well, that, that's dangerous territory, right? Well, it is dangerous territory, and I know in the past um, we talked a lot about the positive side of the prophecy that's embedded in this book. There's also a, a dark side. Indeed. Uh, you know, we're realists, right, Jeff? Uh, someone asked me, am, am, I, am, I, am I an optimist? And, I, you know, I think uh, in the end, everything works out. I think that's a almost a direct quote from A Course in Miracles. But what one has to go through to get to that point um, who knows what it is. And so, yeah, there's a, I mean, just like there's a dark side to America, we know there's a shadow to America. In fact, a lot of these things are coming up now so that they can be brought to the light. Light is the best disinfectant, right? So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, your friend, uh, Glenn Perry, who's been on your program before too, I think, in fact, I don't know if I ever told you this story, Jeff, but um, when I was writing the book, I'd actually done a, um, a a pilot for PBS many years ago on this, on this same sort of topic. And one of the aspects to that pilot dealt with uh, native American um, spirituality. So mm -hmm. I was writing the book and I, I really was looking at the convergence of all these things. I was trying to go back to some of my research done many years ago, 20 years ago on native American spirituality and nothing was hitting. And it just, you know, it, it just wasn't, nothing was fulfilling me. A friend of mine, unbeknownst to her, that I was really looking for this, handed me original politics, making America sacred again. Yeah. You know, send it to me. She goes, I think you'll like this book, not knowing what, what I needed. Well, it was just what the doctor ordered. And yeah. again, I, at the time, and again, I, the synchronicities are starting to fill up here, but uh, it's become rather fulgent, but um, Glenn, I had no idea was connected to you at all had done your mm -hmm. program, yeah. but I read, I read his book and um I probably was a little too excited when I wrote to him the first time. I probably sounded like a deranged fan. I'm like, <laughs> where's this book always been? But I mean, Glenn has done, did a masterful job. And I think also in that book, and I know I've quoted him in, in mine about how America is facing, you know, I think the way he says it is America could turn towards fascism or, you know, we could be on the brink of, of, of perhaps the greatest, um, you know, the greatest history and uh, the greatest chapter in American history. So I think both of those, he, uh, the sacred seeds of America are still present is what he said. Yeah. So I think that the, both of these aspects are, are here and uh, they are present and it's time for choosing, right? I just heard um, my stepson, Lewis, who lives with me, uh, has been in touch with uh, Glenn. Mm -hmm. and uh, He's in India today. Yes, he is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he was oh, I'll tell you what, he 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 flew into New York. He had a 50th reunion, high school reunion, 
had never been to Philadelphia, so I suggested some things he may want to stop and see, including the Constitution Center, where we actually produced some programs in the past. Mm -hmm. And then he went down and he had, so he, and the, the, Ameri the Museum of the American Revolutions there in Philadelphia, he comes down to Williamsburg, had never been to Williamsburg before, which is really the first capital of the country before we became an independent nation. The House of Burgesses was right in Williamsburg, which is about an, an hour from where we are here in Virginia Beach. Fascinating history. You have Jamestown, Yorktown, and Williamsburg. Um, and by the way, Jeff, I heard, I can't remember who you were talking to, but you were talking about Plymouth and the, how the uh, Puritans came to Plymouth and they first settled there. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> My Jamestown antenna went up. Jamestown was actually settled about 15 years before Plymouth Rock. So yeah. Glenn got a chance to take all of that in. And then he came to Virginia Beach. Uh -huh. And again, we did the podcast over at ARE. We had dinner here at the oceanfront. And long story short is we, we had a great time. And then he went off to India. Yeah. Well, he came over, um, was it a couple of years ago for Thanksgiving? And I had a guest at, at the time, Debashish Banerjee, who was head of the uh, one of the, the Department of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And as a result of that, Debashish has hired him to teach there. And I'm pretty sure he's in India with Debashish now. Wow. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah you just don't, you, just, you know, you never know when you're, you step up to do something or you, you meet someone in this uh, in this genre where it where else it could lead to? Yeah, so, what's it going to lead to? Yeah. So, Emmy, did you um, find that your life changed um, significantly once you stepped into uh, doing this work that you have? Because I kind of just I kind of suspect my life will change from from here. We'll go back and go. Yeah, August thirteenth was kind of a new starting point. I would say yes, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely opened my my mind more and the people I'm connecting with. I mean, of course, connecting with Jeff regularly is a incredible gift in my life. And the people I'm connecting with are just phenomenal. And I'm grateful for all that I learned from them. So there's a lot of um a lot of enhancement in in my own consciousness and in my own life in that regard for sure in ways that just keeps ever expanding, right? It's like every time, right? We see Jeff interview somebody or we interview somebody. Uh, it's it never ceases to amaze me how many levels of great learning and depth you can keep going to. No and doubt. And some and, really and, good connections with some fascinating people, Emmy. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, I, Never thought I'd be working with Jeff, and here I am. And uh, just fate seemed to, you know, talk about synchronicities. It just sort of seemed to line up. And now, Christopher, you're joining us in this way, which is a gift. You're incredible, and and your wife as well, and what you both have done for many years. And so, I feel that it's a great gift to have you really bring a higher vibration to new thinking aloud in ways that we may not have considered before as well. Very kind. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here, which of course is one of the very first things I want to let the audience know. So I know we're not officially live yet, although people might be in the room hearing us yeah. chat anyway. Yeah. Well, and it keep and it keeps going. It, it keeps uh, expanding. And Jeff is probably, I think, referring to, I sent him an email the other day of some guests that just in one day, they just sort of lined up in ways that it honestly just felt like destiny it, <laughs> it just sort of just sort of happened. It, it almost seemed like, so it's pretty fascinating how that happens. To be revealed who those guests are later. <laughs> but it's a little tease. Well, very much enjoyed your, your interviews. Um, really uh, opened my eyes and ears to, to a lot of things too. Emmy. so I'm happy to be with both of you. Oh, well, thank you. Us as well. Okay. There we are. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I'm with Emmy Vadness and Christopher 
Naughton today. It's a very special live stream for us because we are welcoming Christopher to our new Thinking Aloud family. And, and Christopher has an incredible bio that I'd like to uh, begin by sharing it with the uh, viewers who are with us now. He is an attorney. He's been a former prosecutor, a civil litigation attorney. But more than that, he's a six-time Emmy Award winner and producer of the American Law Journal TV show that was accepted by American Public Television for distribution to PBS stations. Uh, it's a program that ran for many years. He also has the New World Radio program examining world spiritualities and parapsychology, which is aired on NPR affiliates as well as AM and FM commercial stations. He's also been uh, closely involved with the Unity Church where he lives in Virginia Beach, Virginia. You can see a, a view of the uh, Virginia Beach boardwalk behind him in the uh, video there. Most importantly, in my view, Christopher is a prophet, and he is the author of this wonderful book. We've interviewed him about it, America's Next Great Awakening, how, what the convergence of mysticism, religion, atheism, and science means for the nation and for you. Uh, we were discussing earlier today how prophetic this book is. And uh, of course, prophecy has both a positive side and a dark side. Typically, prophets say, if, if you don't get your act together, look what's going to happen. So uh, I think it suggests we have the possibility of getting our act together and uh, becoming a nation uh, greater than the people who talk about making America great again could ever imagine. I think we have that possibility. Uh, but if we don't uh, reach out and achieve what we're capable of, then there will be darker times ahead for us. So that, that's a theme that's on my mind today as we begin the live stream. So welcome, Christopher. Would you like to make a, an introductory statement yourself? Well, I, I'm just uh, honored uh, to be with both of you. Um, you know, Emmy and I uh, certainly come with uh, some degree of knowledge and uh, know-how about metaphysics, but Jeff, you are the walking Akashic Records. What can I tell you? Uh, I know you've been at it for so many decades. And uh, and I'm honored to be here. I'll just I'll put it uh, that way. And also, uh, Jeff was kind enough to join me for a, a series that I had done through uh, Unity Renaissance Spiritual Center here in southeastern Virginia called the One Mind. And um, it was there that I let Jeff know that when I did my original radio program back in New Jersey at a small public radio station, I interviewed one Jeffrey Mishlove. Uh, who had written the book, The Roots of Consciousness. And uh, I hadn't realized at the time, but it was the second edition that had just been published. And uh, that was, so it was in the early 1990s. And I told Jeff, somewhere in storage, I have a cassette tape that has his, Emmy, you may not even know what that is, but I have a cassette tape that uh, has his name on it. And um, so I'm, I'm glad. So in some ways, this is, this is coming full circle and uh, an answer to prayer of sorts. Well, uh, we're delighted to have you, and uh, I see quite a few questions are, are coming in already, and there's one I want to clear the air. One of our viewers, whose YouTube name is Busha Bandulu, says, why is there a co-host? Is Mishlove retiring? And the answer is no, I am not retiring. I plan to keep doing this work as, as long as I can, but I am 76 years old, and I am slowing down a little bit, and I have other projects, and I want to make sure that New Thinking Aloud is vibrant and active and has a long life ahead of it, because I know from the feedback we get from viewers that we're doing really good work. So I, I am honored to be with people like Emmy Vadness and Christopher Naughton, who uh, are willing and, and happy to join 
uh, in with me on this effort for because new thinking aloud truly is a team effort at, at this point i think for five years i carried the whole thing on my shoulders but uh at this point uh it's it, there's really a community of people, including people behind the scenes right now who are helping to, uh, for example, uh, go through the you know, chat and find the very best questions to send to us to pose to Christopher. Mm -hmm. Wow, we're honored to be with you, Jeff, and I'm honored to be with you, Christopher. And I'm just wondering if we could expand a little bit on what you were suggesting, Jeff, that Christopher is a prophet. And I'm curious, actually, Jeff, could you share why you think that first? And then I'd love to hear what Christopher thinks about that. Well, I think so, because uh, Christopher has a prophetic vision in this book about how streams of uh, social movement that one would think are entirely opposed to each other, like religion and atheism, are actually creating a, a convergence, a, a cauldron, so to speak, where a magic potion is brewing. And uh, it, uh, the, the possibility of things like science and mysticism coming together along with atheism and religion uh, to create a new awakening in the United States is a very, very bold vision, and it's one to which I subscribe, uh, and one one to which I would, I hope that what we're doing is a step in the direction of actualizing that vision. So I, I see uh, Christopher as a uh, almost, almost in the in the same spirit as the new or the Old Testament prophets. It's a nice compliment. Um, as um, if I might, I'm a, I'm a history buff, so you'll have to forgive me. But um, as uh, General Sherman once said, when they asked him to run for president, he said, if nominated, I shall not run. If elected, I shall not serve. So the reason I say that, Jeff, is that that would be a very heavy weight. I would say that I am a student of history and I look at cycles of history and I look at how things do converge. And I think that now that we are in the age of communication and have been here for the last 50 to 100 years, it's inevitable that that belief systems, and I'll put scientific materialism in there, are inevitably going to collide and clash much faster, much more markedly than in the past. Think 150 years ago, William James went across the sea and started meeting people of other religions, and it took years for that information to come back. Now, of course, it's like this. And so what happens is you have these belief systems banging into each other, and that creates collisions and that creates chaos, but it also creates a, a new sine wave, if you will. And so when these two waves hit one another, or four waves in this case, uh, it, it looks pretty messy. It looks chaotic. It looks like disorder. But, you know, much like in old uh, Kabbalistic uh, fair, um, whether we're talking about like, uh, you know, going from the epic accounts of going from exodus to exile to the promised land of Jewish people, or uh, looking even at Christianity and you see, uh, you know, life and death, you know, being on the cross, death, and then a resurrection of Christianity, basically, in order to grow towards love or union or enlightenment, we must be moved from, you know, order. Uh, to disorder or chaos, and then ultimately to reorder. So I don't think that is maybe so prophetic, although thank you for the kind words, but it seems to be a historical, cyclical event that we're going through now, and it looks pretty severe. But if the American ideals at the very center, at the very core of our, our being um, are true, then we'll, we'll make our way through this. That's my hope. Well, well put, and uh, forgive me for uh, keeping uh, too strong a, a metaphor <laughs> on you. I, I, I accept that your uh, work is based on solid scholarship, but I also think that there's a strong element mm -hmm. of intuition that went into it as well, Christopher. 
Well, thank you uh, again, Jeff. And, and thank you, Emmy, for helping me uh, believe again in my intuition. Since sometimes I feel like, have you ever had the feeling, m maybe both of you had the feeling where you felt your intuition was so spot on and you, this is it. I know it. I got it here. And then you, you end up in a cul-de-sac. So um, that happens for people who have been on this path for many years. And it's one of the great mysteries of life. Well, I'll just respond to that. There are times that, and I think a great way to trust your intuition is to think about hindsight and the times that that's happened in my life. <clears throat> sometimes I realize I wasn't looking at the full picture. I was maybe doing wishful thinking and really only looking at maybe a two thirds of the picture. And other times I think there's situations where there was maybe a learning that needed to happen. And so it was just a path I needed to go down for a while. So you know, I, and I also think that people sometimes listen to their intuition so quickly that they don't even realize it's there. I like that too. It's about maybe taking score too early. Sometimes your intuition may be right, but when you're taking score at halftime, <laughs> you know, it's not the final score. Well, and in hindsight, you can look at how did I know it was my intuition when, you, when it was very accurate and then you can use that going forward and then you can refine it a bit more. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Andrei Slavash Krasowski, who is uh, a regular participant in our live streams. And he asks you, Christopher, if you have any plans for who you're going to interview on New Thinking Aloud. Yeah, I, I, I have been giving it a great deal of thought. In fact, when uh, Jeff asked me to do this, uh, I think I wrote 36 names down in about a half hour. So um, now I and I have done some of this in the past, not to the degree that Jeffrey has, but um, I've had three radio stints in my life and they've always been hobbies. I mean, I've made a little money on it, if you will. They've never been jobs. They've always been passions. And so I've had the opportunity and it's reading Emmy's book, for example, I see names like John Kabat-Zinn, who I had the honor of interviewing Herbert Benson, who you mentioned uh, a lot in your book, Emmy, I uh, had a chance to interview him many years ago. And uh, for me, I think, well, first off, uh, maybe some of you have heard that I, I live here in Virginia Beach and I've been here for a number of years. I actually did one tour of duty here in the 1980s. Went to school here. That'll come up at some point. Moved back to New Jersey, practiced law. And then I returned here in the late 1990s. And so the Association for Research and Enlightenment is literally about a mile and a half from my home. That is the Institute, uh, the Edgar Casey Institute. Edgar Casey, again, the great uh, sleeping prophet, the great American prophet, um, who is really the gold standard, I believe, when it comes to, to metaphysics uh, here in this nation and around the world. So I, I know a number of people here through that, through that community. In fact, Jeff, you'd be happy to know that when I was handed the book, The Roots of Consciousness, back in the Paleozoic era, 1990 sometime, um, it came through that community. So that community being open to metaphysics, I mean, whether it was the latest channeler, some people may remember Ramtha or Lazarus, or, you know, when the, the new age hit the 1980s and Shirley, in fact, Shirley MacLaine, after she wrote her book out on a limb and then produced the first, produced that miniseries, the first place she went to, to talk about that series was the Association for Research and Enlightenment because she grew up in Virginia. She and Warren Beatty, her brother, grew up in Virginia and McLean was turned on to Casey at a very, very young age. And so she spoke there. So people associated with Edgar Casey, I've got four or five people on my list. I'm not going to hit you with a barrage of that at first, but for example, Sidney Kirkpatrick, who wrote the definitive book on Edgar Casey, an American prophet, um, good friend of mine and uh, and a man who's just a genius. He's written a number of other New York Times bestsellers, which had absolutely nothing to do with metaphysics. And uh, he wrote this book, which is a tome, and I think the greatest biography on Edgar Casey. He'll be there. Uh, Neil Howe, who wrote uh, the book, The Fourth Turning, um, which is a very popular book, uh, came out in the 1990s. He's just releasing an updated version of that. It talks about the cycles of American history. So we'll have Neil here. I'm bringing a few people in here who are people of color, who um, are really metaphysically tied into metaphysics very deeply. Dr. Nicole Charles, who is a female woman of color, is now the new CEO, relatively new CEO of the Edgar Casey Institute and the Association for Research and Enlightenment. 
And also someone I'll bring in here rather soon is Bishop Carlton Pearson. Now, you guys may not know that name, but back in the 1990s, when the Oklahoma City bombing took place, uh, Bishop Pearson was Oral Roberts' right-hand man. He is a Black bishop. He had 5,000 people in the seats every Sunday. And one Sunday, he got up and said, there is no hell. He got a bolt out of the blue, said, there is no hell. Well, all hell broke loose. And uh, <laughs> because I, if there's no hell, why do I need a savior, right? And people try to pull him back from the from the precipice. He just wouldn't budge. And of course, he lost everything in the material world. Well, they've made a movie on his life called Come Sunday. Uh, Martin Sheen is in it. Uh, Jason Siegel's in it. Um, a great story of his life. And now he does what's called Metacostal Ministries, which is some of his Pentecostal background with metaphysics. So th some of this, you know, I was in my practice of law, I tried to be a mediator when possible. I try to mediate amongst groups when I can. And a guy like Carlton Pearson, who comes from a very traditional evangelical background and now is into metaphysics, I think will be a, a fascinating guest. So those are just some of the some of my ideas right here at the outset. You sound like great guests. I'm excited for those interviews. I have another uh, question here from Elaine Bomford, who asks uh, if Christopher could give uh, us some thoughts about the new thought movements. Oh man, this is something really near and dear to my heart. Um, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, quite frankly, <clears throat> you know, America has gone through these great awakenings in our history. There've been at least two and probably more like three or four, but they show up as these deeply religious, Christic, fundamentalist, very loud, kinds of religious expressions. And they they play a role in the formulation of the American soul. There has been a quieter, less loud, maybe even less boisterous voice that has come up through American history, which I would call sometimes the light shadow to mainstream or evangelical or fundamentalist religion. And these are the voices that don't come out and proselytize so much, don't come out and ask you to join their church, don't come out and say, follow me, I've got the answer. But if we look back at American history, we look at our early foundings of not only the great awakenings of Christianity, but we look at deism and Freemasonry and Unitarianism and the inner light of Quakerism. So these esoteric movements, which are pinned to perennial wisdom, perennial the perennial philosophy that goes back to Egypt, the Hermetic tradition comes up through the republics of Greece and Rome, and 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 even is is part of uh, Native American spirituality. This is part and parcel of the American soul. And I like what Mitch Horowitz has to say, had to say about uh, New Thought. And I'll tie this in. Uh, he once said um, in an interview that I conducted with him, he said, if you really want to know what the founders thought, look to the transcendentalist about a hundred years later. And to me, the transcendentalists are the great repository of American wisdom. And why is that? And we're talking about Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and Margaret Fuller and Emily Cady Stanton and others. Some of these names, unfortunately, lost a history, right? Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott, who wrote A Little Women. This cadre, this intellectual radical salon of metaphysics was the linchpin of what started New Thought. And um, Jeff was, was, was very kind. Uh, I, on my radio program, every once in a while, I used to like to do pop quizzes. So when I interviewed, well, Jeff was interviewing me, but I, I couldn't help myself. I had to throw a pop quiz back at Jeff. Forgive me, Jeff. But um, I asked him, since I know he and I are both uh, big believers in uh, what William James has brought to this nation. And he, by the way, coined the term New Thought. I asked uh, Jeff if he knew that in, in Christian religions, the godfather is your spiritual teacher. And I asked him, well, who was William James's godfather? And Jeff, you answered. Yeah, Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah. Um, Jeff got full credit. I think he's got a free trip to Orlando coming up. <laughs> he looks under his seat. There it is. Um, but, but new thought really is, you know, was, was really birthed, if you will, by early deism and Freemasonry and Unitarianism and Transcendentalism. So New Thought blossomed in the late 1800s and you had a center, well, what is now Centers for Spiritual Living, but then was a religious science, Ernest Holmes and, Holmes and religious science. You had Charles and uh, Myrtle Fillmore who started Unity. 
and 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 just a just a raft of new thought perspectives. And you know, if if there is one ounce of prophecy, if you will, in in my book, I I'm thinking that new thought is going to come more to the fore in America's thinking, emerging from the soul of America and play a much more prominent role since it is ecumenical, it is mystical, it venerates science, and it doesn't create enemies saying, I've got the answer and you don't. So um, thank you for the question. I think you will hear a number of new thought themes coming up uh, when I interview some of my guests. I think that new thought uh, in in the form of um, the power of positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale, has already uh, really become mainstream in the business community. Uh, my wife, Janelle, is very active in the National Speakers Association, and there are hundreds of motivational speakers who are really spreading the message of uh, new thought uh, throughout the the business world. It's become, I think, uh, really uh, the gospel of, uh, and it, it's combined with the American pragmatic attitude. It's really deeply ingrained in the uh, American can-do attitude. Well, it's the religion of healthy mindedness, which again is what William James, you know, said at that time. And you bring up Norman Vincent Peale, and I write about him in, 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 in the book. And, you know, in some ways, Peale was a genius. And why, why was he a genius? He took all of new thought, and pardon me, he JC'd it up, right? He brought Jesus Christ uh, and he, he meshed that good old time religion with new thought. Now, to both his credit and uh, a bit of a, a, of a castigation here or criticism, if you will, is Norman Vincent Peale did bring new thought, positive thinking, positive attitude. The mind is the builder, as Edgar Casey said, mind is everything. Two men looked outside prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. So Norman Vincent Peale saw stars, but he never credited any of the new thought giants. Now, and I, I do reveal this in the, I don't, I'm not the first to reveal it. Mitch Horowitz and others have spoken about it before, but I speak about the fact that Norman Vincent Peale loved Ernest Holmes, who started Science of Mind and Religious Science. He, in fact, when he was a young reporter, when Peale was a young reporter and he was couldn't find his way. His editor said, stop thinking of yourself. If you're thinking of yourself, you're always going to be afraid. And he handed him a book by Ernest Holmes. So Norman Vincent Peale as a young journalist just eats this stuff up, completely imbues his soul. And he moves forward. And of course, the rest is history. He writes one of the greatest selling books of all time, The Power of Positive Thinking. And he actually meets Ernest Holmes on a movie set it was called One Foot in Heaven, late 1940s, was nominated for Best Picture that year. It was about a story of, a, of the life of a minister. And Ernest Holmes and, and Norman Vincent Peale meet. The sad thing is, Norman Vincent Peale never once in his biography, never once in any of his tracks, never in any of his publications ever said, this guy Ernest Holmes was, was an amazing man and influenced me towards the end of his life. Peel basically gave him some credit, but nothing too broadly. So, and I, and again, I would put Joel Osteen in, in the same sort of category. Joel Osteen may be the most popular preacher on the planet, but you know, if you listen to some of his sermons, some of which are quite good, very little of it is, you know, deals with Bible or Bible scripture. It really is a lot of positive thinking, new thought. So that's another way, new thought finds itself in American consciousness, but finds itself there maybe through not new thought channels or new age channels, but finds itself in more mainstream channels. And it's been adopted. It just hasn't been credited. Since we're on new thinking aloud, Jeff, do you have any comments about new thought connected to new thinking? <laughs> new thinking aloud? Well, th well, there surely there's a continuity. William James, uh, who was raised in the milieu of the New Thought movement and then went into become the founder of uh, American psychology, uh, American parapsychology, which was then known as psychical research, uh, American pragmatic philosophy, and 
Of, of course, the uh, field of religious studies, William James was the founder of all of those things, uh, was an enormous influence on me. So I, I see that the uh, work that I do is uh, uh, part of the, that continuity. In fact, e even today, uh, my wife and I uh, are teachers in the uh, Holmes Institute, which is uh, sponsored by what is now the Centers for uh, Spiritual Life, uh, formerly the uh, Church of Religious Science, founded by um, Ernest Holmes. So uh, they embrace parapsychology. I teach their parapsychology course, and mm -hmm. I teach a course there on William James. They're very open Wonderful. to uh, learning more about William James. Whereas today, even though William James is honored universally as the founder of American psychology, he's rarely taught anymore in psychology courses. Yeah, uh, Philip Gura, I have his book back here on, on the Transcendentalist, and he said that William James was the greatest thinker in American history. And that's that's a, a hard one uh, really to argue with. And then I've got another Bible back here called The American Soul by Jacob Needleman. And of course, of course, Jeffrey interviewed him while he was still here on the planet. But uh, one of the many things that Jacob and and Jacob influenced people like Mitch Horowitz as well, who you've had on the program. In fact, I think Mitch actually was the was the editor of that book, um, uh, The American Soul. In that book, he says that America essentially has a mystical core, and that the hallmark of American thinking is pragmatic mysticism. Pragmatic mysticism. I love it. In mm -hmm. some ways, that's what new thinking allowed is to me. I mean. It's hard to describe something like that in, in two words, but, you know, the mystics that we talk about or that Needleman or Horowitz or you, Jeff, talk about, these mystics were not ones that just simply cloistered themselves and tried to elevate the consciousness of the planet. These are people who were deeply touched by mystical experiences and then channeled that into action. And so as we talk about new thought and we talk about transcendentalists, one of the reasons that I venerate the transcendentalists so much in my writing and in my speaking is because these people were not just eloquent in their lofty ideals. These are people who put their boots on and got marching and they got involved and they got their hands dirty sometimes, no doubt. Uh, when um, they passed, you know, Emerson, of course, was around at the time of the Civil War. And when they passed the... Um, the uh, F Fugitive Slavery Act, which basically was telling Northerners, guess what, guys, if a slave runs away from the South, runs up North, you are duty bound as a Northerner to arrest or get that person arrested so that that chattel or property could come back to the South. And Ralph Waldo Emerson went out there and he said, I will not obey it by God. And he said, I feel we're either on the road to ending slavery or ending freedom as we know it still raises the hair up on the back of my neck when I hear those the words, because what an influence in American consciousness. No one is, is greater. So anyway, these, these are just, just some of the influences, and, um, and they still ring true today. Now, here's a question, again, from Andrei Slavash Krasowski. He says, what is your opinion about so-called toxic positivity, or generally the possibility that positive thinking, if taken the wrong way, may bring more harm than, than good. And I have to say, uh, normally I avoid politics on New Thinking Aloud, but since we've been talking about Norman Vincent Peale, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, the former president, Donald Trump, uh, was a member of uh, the Marble Collegiate Church where Norman Vincent Peale preached. Yeah, and his biographer, Gwen Blair, said that um, th that the, the former president weaponized positive thinking. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I would look at that as, you know, one of the, the dark sides to positive thinking is that, uh, you know, one can become waif-like, you know, uh, in this three-dimensional world that we've all signed up for, uh, just thinking don't always make it so. I mean, I love the phrase, do what you love and the money will follow. But I'm sure some people out in this audience, maybe some members of the of of the moderators have, have you know realized a bump or two along the lines there. We have visualized, we have believed, we have prayed. and and sometimes those things don't necessarily um, 
come to pass. And uh, I think it was Emerson who said that, you know, metaphysics alone is not enough. Sometimes, and I wish I had the quote right here. It's in, my, it's, it's in one of the chapters, but it, it basically is saying that um, metaphysics must be measured up against the results in your life. Otherwise, it doesn't have a whole lot of applicability, um, which again, I'll, I'll double or triple down on. But you can weaponize anything and, and positive power, positive thinking could be weaponized as well. Um, we can perhaps create uh, amazing uh, scenarios for our ego if we so choose that path. And positive thinking could, could lead you down that path too. Or as my friend once said, he put a bumper sticker on his car saying, visualize me rich. <laughs> well, and positive thinking can also sometimes brush over mm, negative thoughts or emotions or past losses or grief. And that can also be harmful because a person is denying uh, their full self in that regard. And at the same time, if you go deeper, one might argue that being positive, love and light is who we really are. And so that's probably why we're all wearing a rainbow yin yang pin here today is that it's all of those are maybe true simultaneously. There's a question here that comes from one of our volunteers and moderators, Laura Newbert. She asks, what do you predict will happen when all wake? And another of her questions is, how do we help one another in this process for you, Christopher? Oh, it's for me. Yeah, the easy questions. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know what it looks like. I, you know, let me just uh, borrow something from, um, from Edgar Casey once again. Um, now, Casey talked about a fifth route race. I uh, didn't give a time frame for it, but sometime after, well after his death. And this is a, a race uh, of people which are more highly spiritual, highly metaphysical, highly psychic, um, where psi phenomena and notions such as uh, near-death experiences are no longer castigated by scientific materialism, but accepted as probable or likely. Um, I think we are moving more towards ecumenism, which doesn't mean uh, some people really get afraid that, you know, we're only going to have roses in the garden or they're just going to be lilacs and that's it, as opposed to thinking unity in diversity, which to me is the great calling um, of the nation. So I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I think waking up is that we start understanding that even though we have volunteered to come into these rather limiting three-dimensional suits, that ultimately we are connected. Uh, my Angela once said, you're not your brother's keeper, you are your brother. That's a pretty tough one to wrap your head around when you're living in a, a separate body, a separate house, driving a separate car, and you bump into somebody, and how dare you bump into me? Um, but I think that is, you know, those are the bifocals we're working with, right? We're individuals. We're here to carry out what we're charged to do. And ultimately, you know, we're all coming from the same root, the same electrical source, what have you. Ultimately, we are one. It's tough as an individual ego to understand that sometimes. But I think if we're talking about the mo most positive uh, evolution, uh, then we're talking about a uh, greater understanding of our oneness, how we really are all indeed connected. Mm -hmm. And do you have suggestions on how we can help each other do that? Uh, please read Emmy Vadis's book on intuition, which right now is uh, captivating me. And I, I mean, I, it sounds tongue in cheek, Emmy, but it's, it's a glorious, amazing book. I see why Jeff wrote the forward and why he had so many wonderful endorsements, but um yeah, I think, you know, relying more on our intuition. And, um, and again, a lot of the things that Edgar Casey talked about over 100 years ago, prayer and meditation and serving one another and uh, looking at the Beatitudes um, and, you know, being red letter Jesus readers, if you will. What it, we don't care about the story about Jesus or, you know, uh, maybe what Paul said in, in the Bible, but what did the man Jesus is, has purported to have said? following those words, uh, whether you read them in the Gnostic Gospels or Thomas Jefferson's Bible or the King James Bible. Um, but I'm serious. Pick up Emmy's book. Good place to for the next step. 
Thank you, Christopher. And I just want to echo that Jeff wrote uh, an amazing book too that often isn't discussed, Side Development Systems. And I'm wondering, Jeff, if you could share a little bit about that book with us, because I think that there was, somebody's interviewed you about it, but I don't think it's mentioned a lot. And I believe that was your doctoral dissertation. Is that correct? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Side Development Systems was my doctoral dissertation. It was published uh, as a hardbound and then a uh, paperback book by Ballantyne many, many years ago, I think 1987, if I recall correctly. Uh, and it was, uh, it had three chapters or, or three main sections. One was historical. We looked at the, the ancient traditions, yoga and shamanism uh, and, and so on. And then uh, many, many modern popular traditions, things like Scientology and Transcendental Meditation and Silva Mind Control, and then the uh, experimental work that has been done was, was the third section. So uh, in the field of parapsychology, it's such a small discipline that even today, nearly um, 40 years after I've uh, written the book, there's been very, very little written in, uh, about how to train psychic abilities. On, on the other side, on the popular uh, literature, there's a vast literature. You can go almost to any airport bookstore and you'll find books about how, how to be more psychic and how to uh, e evolve. Um, so, so yes, Emmy, thank you. That is a kind of a forgotten book. Uh, there's a question here from uh, one of our- Can I say one thing, Jeff? I mean, okay. If I may just interject for just a moment. That's sure. also the price you pay for being a pioneer sometimes. When you're on, when you're on that much of a leading edge, uh, not only are you going to suffer some of the slings and arrows, but sometimes- it gets missed. It's it's sometimes it's the second, third, or fourth generation after standing on your shoulders that that gets more attention. That's all I had yeah. to say. Well, I, I thank you, and I think there's some truth to that. I also, uh, when you were talking about the um, power of positive thinking and how sometimes you do everything uh, that's correct and nothing happens, uh, I was reminded of an old ad that uh, the McDonald's corporation used to run and talking about patience. Sometimes you just have to be patient, maybe even more than one lifetime patient uh, for things to work out. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of my vision of New Thinking Aloud is that uh, what we're engaged in here is a project that's larger than my lifetime. Uh, I think that... Uh, the things that we're talking about now, I know that we have a large audience for uh, this topic, but um, it's not a large audience compared to other YouTube channels. Uh, however, I, I envision the day will come when the, the things that we talk about will really be uh, central to uh, mass culture. Uh, and that day may be uh, hundreds of years away or thousands of years away for all I know. Um, well, maybe not so. that long. I also just want to add, because I'm uh, representing the healthcare sector, being a healthcare practitioner, that I do see that uh, approaches like energy healing, Reiki, Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, uh, the science of showing the benefits of people who, not that people have to necessarily believe in, quote, a God, but people who identify as more spiritual, not necessarily always as religion, as religious, that these folks, there are incredible health benefits. So this is making its way deeper into the healthcare system as well. So there, there is a movement that's uh, well on its way happening here, at least in America. Okay. So, uh, Suzanne Taylor, who is one of our regular uh, viewers and a very interesting person in her own right, uh, would like you to comment on, um, it's a complicated question, so I'm going to simplify it and ask if, if you have any thoughts about Teilhard de Chardin and uh, his vision for uh, the future of humanity. Wow. Um, well, I um, 
I actually have an epigraph in my book. So that's that solitary quote that takes up an entire page at the beginning. And it is from Chardin. It's like everything that rises must converge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here is a great Jesuit. So he's, he's playing in the Catholic church. He's playing in orthodoxy. And yet here he is uh, talking about a new sphere talking long before there was an internet long before uh, we had uh, cell phones talked about basically a mental construct, a consciousness construct around the planet. And basically what he saw, foresaw was, and, you know, again, we all stand on giants and Chardin is one of those giants where he saw a convergence of belief systems. Uh, he was seeing it already in his lifetime. I mean, uh, Eastern philosophy was starting to wend its way West. In fact, had done so by the time he passed in 1955 you know, we have to thank the William Jameses for that. We have to thank, uh, you know, the Gandhis and the Howard Thurmans for that, for bringing East to the West. And he spoke about the cosmic Christ. So Chardin paid the price, though. The, um, the Catholic Church placed a monotum on his writings. They did not excommunicate him. They didn't push him out like they did Matthew Fox years later. But they did not allow him to speak on matters of religion or spirituality. He could only speak on matters of um, science and botany and, and, and things such, a, such as that. Long story short, though, is that Chardin is a great influence. He foresaw, you want to talk about a, a true prophet, he foresaw the convergence of belief systems and believed that that was the true savings grace of this planet. And he also believed that the omega point is not something that may happen is destined to happen and maybe that person who asked the question a little while ago what does awakening look like maybe we can reference their chardin's and make a point where there is this there is this awakening where people realize come to really realize if not experience their oneness with one another so he's a giant in my mind long story short beautiful answer here's a question for you christopher this is from and Anasis, if i'm saying that correctly as a new host, what do you particularly like about Emmy, myself, and Jeffrey's interviews? And what do you plan to do differently? If you have any thoughts on that yet. Well, I, you know, um, if I can make a reference here, I'm sorry, Valerie's probably pulling her hair out. She's watching this because she goes, she tells me not to go off the, the track sometimes. But let me just, I'm going to throw a syllogism out here for an example. I think she's already texting me saying, <laughs> keep it tight. But anyway, <laughs> um, I was a great, I love the Moody Blues. Uh, Jeff, you must have listened to the Moody Blues oh, when you're younger, right? Great spiritual yeah. group. Emmy, I know they came a little later. I uh, like Moody Blues, yeah. Moody Blues are wonderful. I mean, they. I mean, their first few albums, uh, Timothy Leary's Dead and Always on the Outside Looking In, lots of stuff. Expansion of awareness. When... Well, their, their keyboardist had to retire because he was uh, elder, elderly and he was getting sick. And then another guy had to retire. They actually brought women into the band. Now, some people did not like that. You know, when someone new comes along and they look and act a little differently, you could almost expect to see a little bit of resistance. Now, Emmy, I know that Jeff has a very gracious audience and they're open, but there might have been a few people saying, OK, prove yourself to me, you know. You know, you're up against this Titan, you know, can you, can you still play on the same field as he does? And I just have to tell you, you know, I love your style. And again, I'm just not blowing smoke here just because we're, we're going live today, but I had to, you know, I had to weigh in and say, okay, let, let's see how Emmy does. I mean, she's, <laughs> she is up against the Titan in the field, but Emmy, you've done a remarkable job. I, and in fact, I, I think I've even taken some examples. Um, and I spoke when I spoke with you last time about, um, how you are gracious and open and let people answer, but you don't let them necessarily get off the hook if they haven't answered the question. And so you've come back to them. And there were one or two interviews where, you know, one person was really difficult to pin down and you just so graciously did it. So I love your style. I love your interview style. And, 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 and of course, Jeff, your encyclopedic knowledge is, is always staggering. I mean, I've learned more about Vedantas and Upanishads and the Urantia. I mean, I, you know, things that I only touched on briefly, if at all. Um, you know, I, when I did my radio programs, rarely if ever touched on on UFOs and UAPs, et cetera. 
And you've done it in such an intelligent fashion that it gives bones to something that has been considered, let's face it, woo for many, many decades. Uh, and and that's, that's the hard thing too. You're taking something that's amorphous and you're trying to give it structure. So as a pioneer, and I hope before we leave today, I'll have a chance to answer, ask a question or two as well. But I love both of their styles. I think for me, uh, you know, I'm going to be who I am within the umbrella and the rubric of what Jeff has set up here. So it's not going to be dramatically or drastically different, but my background is in law. My background is in American constitutional precepts. I do see us at a crossroads here in the nation. I have also um, been a mediator between the most fundamental uh, among us and uh, the most esoteric. Uh, I shared this with Jeff and I know some of my friends' heads fell off, but years ago, after I long I was already a lawyer, I had also already been a prosecutor, I disappointed my parents greatly by moving to Virginia Beach because not only was I going to be studying the Edgar Casey readings, I was going to be going to graduate school for broadcast journalism, which just happened to be at the university, which was headed up by Mr. Pat Robertson, who started the 700 Club, which today is Regent University. So maybe some of some minds are exploding already in your in your uh, entourage or people in your audience today, Jeff. But my uh, approach to life has always been to mediate and and really to find out what is great and what is beneficial to humankind, regardless of politics or religion, which is hard, right? In a day of immense polarization. But I'm hoping to bring some of that to to uh, what I do, and also to tap into some of the esoteric. Um, wisdom of African American and Native American uh, spiritualities, which I know Jeff has touched on, but I find such a rich, mystical, metaphysical foundation for the works of Martin Luther King and Howard Thurman and 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 many others. I mean, the entire nonviolent revolution uh, theories that have grown up in this nation have come from great metaphysical minds. So I'll I'll bring some of that to the table as well. Excellent. I just want to offer, Christopher, that you also bring a, a wealth of your own experience in media. And I love what you say about mediating. My own mother was a professional mediator, and I saw how she was actually often referred to by the county judge. She was actually able, I think, to, to solve about 80% of the cases amicably that were presented to her rather than it being contentious. And, uh, and I know attorneys have their place for sure. So I, I love that. And as far as uh, co-hosting here with Jeff, it, it was very intimidating. That is very true. Uh, at the same time, Jeff has just been incredibly gracious to me. And now I see how he is with you and with his audience. And uh, I certainly have not felt any type of competition at all. I've never tried to be Jeff. I can't be Jeff. <laughs> um, we can only be ourselves. And at the same time, I know that the audience loves Jeff and, and, but the audience has also been very embracing of me for the most part, but uh, yeah, Jeff is incomparable and that's why he is so fabulous. And we're so lucky to be with him. Here, here. We got a question from a viewer whose YouTube name is Mid-Century Modern Lady. Uh, who, this is a very interesting question. I've never thought of it uh, quite this way before. She said, some scholars have proposed that Jesus was an animal rights activist who opposed animal sacrifices in ancient Judaism, a big business at the time. Do you have any thoughts on this and on our treatment of animals? Is that is that directed to me or can anyone here jump in? Well, we can all we can all jump in, but you're in the hot seat today, Christopher. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, it wouldn't surprise me because uh, let's face it: when Jesus came along, he was up against the Sanhedrin. Well, he was up against both Rome, which basically the Sanhedrin uh, again the the the, the Jewish uh, Jewish high priests at the time um, were 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 running things locally, but at the behest of the government. In some ways, it doesn't, it's not unlike what happened in this country where, you know, evangelicalism became very strong, very marked, very conservative, very fundamentalist, but they were 
basically basically answering to or you know playing up to uh, the political forces of its time and i know that animal sacrifice was big in orthodox judaism but there came a time where a new consciousness came down the planet came through the planet that said we don't have to be killing animals to please a god that gets ticked off at us half the time and has anger management issues um so is it plausible that that jesus um who we associate often with you know holding a lamb or riding in on a donkey um would love animals i mean certainly I love animals. We've always had pets. Um, I find their their God consciousness is rather amazing. So no, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Is there something in scripture? Not that I know of. Maybe in the Gnostic Gospels or one of the more esoteric texts, there might be such things. Uh, so no firsthand evidence or proof of that, but it sounds reasonable to me. What do you guys think? Well, it, it is true that uh, the practice of uh, animal sacrifice was discontinued uh, around that time. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, I, to my knowledge, it was never, it never became a Christian practice. Um, and and uh, rabbinical Judaism also uh, really you know, stopped the practice as well and began focusing in on uh, the nature of sacrifice. What does it mean for an individual to uh, make a sacrifice? Uh, and they began to look at it uh, more in moral terms than in ritualistic terms. So I'm, I'm sure the early rabbis uh, had a lot to do with it as well as Jesus. I know, for example, around the same era was a great rabbi Hillel, and he and Jesus both had different versions of the golden rule. Uh, Jesus was saying, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and Hillel was saying, do not unto others as, as you would not have them do unto you. So there, there is a sense in which um, the teachings of Jesus are consistent with uh, a lot of the teachings of uh, what became rabbinical Judaism, and, and particularly, I believe, associated with the uh, Essenes and with the um, early uh, Gnostic uh, cults at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting question. Yeah, I think it's a great topic just for our modern time as well, as far as how our relationships are with animals and how we treat them, whether we choose to sacrifice them for our meals or um, have them as pets or protect them in nature. I think it's a great question to help us ponder that. Here's a question from this person has this name that uh, it's a rune. It's the old Norse rune. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but their question is, could you recommend any North American poets that the younger generation might not have heard of? To Pablo, Pablo, Neruda, <laughs> Pablo Neruda comes to, comes to mind. Uh, of course, I guess he's not North American, right? Central American. Um, great romanticist. Um, but my goodness, uh, Jeff, you've done wonderful interviews with, uh, of course, they're European, but Yates and Keats and my goodness, James James Tooney, uh, you know, did a did a wonder has done wonderful shows on some of the the great bards and their spiritual proclivities. So, Jeff might have some better insights. Robert Frost has always been a, a great uh, American uh, poet as well. Well, uh, speaking of poets, we uh, have a whole series of interviews with Charles Upton, who was uh, regarded as the youngest member of the beat generation of, of uh, poets. His book of poetry, two books of his of poetry were published by Lawrence Ferlinghetti at City Lights Book and Books in San Francisco, which was the publishing house for the beat generation. And uh, subsequently, Charles became a, a member of the 
I guess you'd have to call it the traditionalist movement, which is a fascinating movement. Some people think of it as a bit archaic. Other people think of it as the essence of ecumenical in, 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 in the sense of honoring the mystical traditions of every religion and finding the, the common threads. Uh, and we've done an interesting interview uh, recently about the concept of theodicy, which is the how do you justify the idea that uh, God is good when you see so much evil in God's creation? And um, he read some of his own poetry addressing that very question. I thought it was very deep and uh, well worth reading from my point of view. James Tunney, who has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud, uh, probably more than any other guest, I think we're just about up to 40 <laughs> interviews with him, is also a poet. In fact, he has a new book of poetry. It happens to be sitting right here on my desk. It's called The Mystic Murmuration, in, in which he writes poems about many of the topics in the uh, interviews we've done with him. So uh, I highly recommend it. I'm starting to enjoy poetry more. A friend of mine is sends me poets from, uh, excuse me, poems from Mary Oliver. So I just want to mention a female. And also I've been writing more poetry myself. So I also just want to encourage people with their own inner creativity that it's wonderful to be inspired and be moved deeply by these amazing people, but also to uh, to tap into your own resources, if you would like, as well. In, in fact, we have a weekly newsletter. Many viewers uh, may not realize this. It's a free newsletter. It goes out every week. And we do publish poetry in, in the newsletter. We publish uh, one of your poems, as I recall, Emmy. And we've also published several poems by another one of our volunteers, Laura Newbert, who is uh, a well-known and published poet, particularly in uh, uh, the South Dakota region. She's very active in uh, the Historical Society of South Dakota. and. Uh, I encourage our viewers to uh, submit poetry if they like to be published in our newsletter. Mm -hmm. Recently, a viewer did submitted three poems, and I uh, asked him, what was this? And, and he said to me, oh, I was drunk. Oh. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, there, there is a sense in which sometimes alcohol can inspire wonderful poetry. I'm not I'm not opposed to poetry that emerges from altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Which actually brings up a question I'd like to pose to you, Christopher. I don't think we've ever discussed it. Do you have any views on uh, altered states of consciousness? Yeah, the, from I mean, um, since we're getting a little personal here, I'll I'll, I'll share some stories. I mean, Really, uh, although Jeff, I was born a little too late. I would have been wonderful to have. Boy, imagine being in Berkeley in the '60s. I can't imagine. You know, sometime maybe we got to sit down and have dinner with this man and just focus in on that that issue. But uh, yeah, I came of age uh, in college in the '70s, and honestly, uh, what triggered my a, a big a big shift was uh, was to in, get involved in, with hallucinogens. I learned later I was in good company. Uh, Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, others said, you know, Houston Smith, the man that you were close to and interviewed. Uh, Houston Smith, who was asked, and you know some of the history because you've interviewed Don Latin, but I love this. Houston Smith, one of the great uh, religious minds in America, uh, son of Chinese uh, missionaries, uh, Americans, uh, you know, had never had a mystical experience in his life. And he was friends with Aldous Huxley. And Huxley said, well, you should meet this chap from Harvard. You know, the chaps from Harvard happened to be Leary and Richard Albert, who, Alpert, who later became Ram Dass. And they were conducting the Good Friday experiment. So they wanted to have a control group. Uh, one would take the hallucinogen. I think it was mushrooms at the time, psilocybin. And the other ones would take aspirin. Soon became very clear who was taking the aspirin, who was taking the psilocybin. But Houston Smith said, you know, he had never had a mystical experience until that moment. 
So I think under controlled circumstances, and now that we're starting to see hallucinogens come back, because in some ways, Leary opened the door, but then he also sullied it by being a little megalomaniac in his approach. And, uh, you know, the others, such as Houston Smith and Ron Dawson and, and others, uh, took a more venerated approach that was a, a, truly a sacrament, which I think Aldous Huxley refers to in one of his, uh, uh, the, I think, the book Island, you know, looks at this as a sacrament. And when it's treated like that, I think it can help people advance. Now, Having said that, Alan Watts' answer to this was, you know, it's like the telephone. Once you get the answer, hang up, Jeff, which I know you've, you've uh, commented on. So I think, you know, those kinds of, of things can take you only so far. If, and again, if you're talking about alternative, uh, you know, um, and what was the phrase exactly, Jeff? Alternative methods or modalities? Altered towards, states of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness. So it, it, it certainly gets w well outside of, using any kind of, you know, mushroom or drug, et cetera. And uh, certainly we're fascinated um, by what can be done in meditation, what can be done um, through near-death experiences, um, that sort of thing, which is, if you will, a more natural, but it's all part of a continuum. And I think it can all, you know, raise our own personal consciousness as well as those we interact with. Uh, well, it's just a one minute after the top of the hour, so I want to let our viewers know we plan on continuing another half hour, roughly, to the bottom of, of the hour. And I would like to comment about uh, Houston Smith, because he published a book called uh, Cleansing the Doors of Perception. Uh, it was sort of, uh, I guess, a takeoff on Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception. Mm -hmm. and. In it, he actually included as an appendix uh, an excerpt from my interview with him in which he talked about uh, research he did when he was uh, at MIT in those days, had just had this mystical experience. Uh, and he used what is known in psychology as a Q-sort, where he took statements from the great mystics of history and wrote them down on three by five cards, along with statements from psychedelic drug users about their experience. And he gave them to his uh, colleagues and students in the Department of Religious Studies at MIT. And he said, can you sort these cards and put in one pile, the statements by the mystics, and another pile, the statements by the uh, psychedelic drug users. Mm -hmm. And he discovered that they could not distinguish between them. The statements about the experience itself were so similar that, uh, that even specialists in the field uh, could not discriminate. However, he pointed out that if you look at the lives of the great mystics, what you see is an entire life dedicated to this work. And uh, the mystics, the great mystics in particular, they founded orders, they established hospitals, they did good work throughout their lives. They lived out the experience that they had, whereas mm -hmm. If you look at the lives of people who went through the 60s and 70s and 80s, you'll see that uh, some of them, I, I would like to think that what we're doing today is living out the essence of those peak experiences, but many people aren't able to do that, or, or it doesn't occur to them, or si the situation doesn't arise for them to do that. And, and I suspect the same is true for other people. I think mystical experiences are probably far more common than we acknowledge. Yeah, because people are often scared to share it with somebody, or they are afraid they might be diagnosed or labeled as crazy, or people won't believe them, or they're even having maybe a hard time digesting it themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's a question for you, Christopher, from uh, Leah, as the YouTube name of this viewer, who asks, uh, if you have a, a spiritual practice or a self-care practice, 
I do. I do. And um, in the last, um, you know, and, and like many of us who have returned on to meditation, in fact, I, again, going back to what we were just talking about, after the, uh, the hallucinogen, hallucinogenic experience in college, um, and maybe we were blessed to have, you know, the Moody Blues and the Beatles to listen to while we were tripping. I mean, it led us to med meditation. Uh, so, uh, you know, meditation has been part of my life. I can't say I've always been diligent, but my life works better when I meditate and my will and and pray, uh, both and both. And I also have been a member of, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, a Unity Church going back to New Jersey and here in Virginia, you know, what we call Unity Renaissance Spiritual Life Center in southeastern Virginia, and uh, believe that that and just. Being in the presence of those people sometimes, that's a practice in and of itself, just showing up sometimes, right? What did Woody Allen say? 90% of life is just showing up. So just being in a unity spiritual center sometimes and feeding off of those people who have, like being in this great holistic salon that we're, that we're you know, that I'm so honored to be part of, sharing ideas. That is part of my practice. I also like to meditate, spend time with my pets. Um, you know, I have some great friendships. I consider that being part of my practice, uh, get a massage up here at the, uh, at the ARE from time to time. Um, so those are all part and parcel of, um, of keeping my life balanced. And I also coach too. And I think that that's actually, when you coach someone, you're really helping yourself as much as the per person you're coaching. There is really a symbiosis between that. And I, about two year, two or three years ago, uh, a person I would call my mentor, uh, Alan Cohen, uh, and I was in kind of in a, a midway point in my life and uh, he was doing a coaching program. I felt like, well, I'll probably never use this. Well, I took that coaching program and it's been amazing. And finally, last but not least, I've also uh, been taught uh, and been schooled in heart math. And I find that heart math is also, and I know Emmy, you write about it, uh, you know, in your book as well. Uh, which is also akin to a meditation practice. So lots of things, just try to be mindful. What is the heart math practice? Well, the heart math practice, and I, it's about heart rate variability. And and I'm going to turn it over to Emmy here in a second, because she, she'll probably be able to uh, talk about it better than I can. Valerie's actually been taking a heart math uh, course, and that's been part of her upcoming uh, coaching practice too, which basically allows us to recharge. Uh, we, we we basically jettison a lot of energy through the day through useless, useless action or mindless thinking, et cetera. And heart math, which again is meditative like attempts to regenerate us by creating greater heart rate variability. Is that close Emmy? Yeah, I think it's everything that we're talking about today and what new thinking allowed is all about and what Jeff has been studying all the way going back to his doctoral dissert dissertation, even before that, that it's heart math. My understanding is that it looks at uh, your coherence, how coherent you are or not with yourself. And they've done research on showing that the heart has a greater, greater electromagnetic field than the brain. And so the more that we can get into those uh, positive states of mind and through meditative processes, breath work, focusing on the heart, I think one of their main methods is creating a, their quick coherent technique is creating a regenerative thought of being appreciative for something or someone while simultaneously imagining that you're breathing in and out of your heart. And, uh, and there's really hard science that shows that when people do that, that their heart rate variability, which is the, the space between the heart beats, the more that we have co uh, our variability to that, we have a greater resilience in how we function in our lives and our mind, body, spirit. And it shows that the more that people can get into that state of consciousness, the greater their health is going on in life. And so, some yeah. of that work, Jeff, is tied into the Global Consciousness Project and, uh, you know, some of the and the, the work done at uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences, where people can know things before they happen. Uh, it, it, as Emmy was talking about, you know, the knowledge and the awareness and the wisdom that literally comes from the heart chakra, um, you know, is daunting. Uh, apparently, again, I think Emmy said it best, there's more information coming from, going from the heart to the brain than the other way around. Yeah. 
And I, I intend to bring somebody on in the first few months uh, from HeartMath and joining us here. So wonderful. Wonderful. We've got a question from Elaine Bomford, uh, who asks, how can we best appreciate Masonic Enlightenment, Rosicrucian, Unitarian values held by white founding fathers, while also acknowledging their participation in Native American genocide and slavery? Great questions, really fantastic questions, and they should be asked. I would say a couple of things. Um, it's hard for me as a 21st century individual to judge somebody by 21st century standards who lived in the 18th century. Uh, many of the things that I grew up with in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, I probably wouldn't say or think or act upon today. Why? Because, you know, we have evolved. Some would say that has become woke and we've become a little too timid in expressing ourselves, but I'll leave that to the side for a, a moment. But, you know, there, there is this notion that those people who were slaveholders, Thomas Jefferson's, the George Washington's, um, that happened to be commonality. There, you know, there was that great notion at that time that when God created the races, certain races were supposed to do certain things. Now, I would also say at that same time that they were one of the first ones to, to start getting off the boat, meaning that even as they created these highly idealistic documents, the Constitution, the Declaration, et cetera, they realized that even though they themselves would not realize it in their lifetime, they were setting a grappling hook out to the future. They were ideals and pulling that into the present and basically saying, we're not here yet, but this is the ideal. And slowly but surely, America began to do that. So we never would have had the Civil War without having the ideals of the revolution. And those seeds were being planted, but they couldn't go on, they couldn't go from zero to a hundred miles an hour in one lifetime. People such as Washington did free slaves later. Jefferson apparently got much better with it. And uh, you know, it was a hundred years later that a lot of those Virginians would have had to have disgorged or given up their chattel. But again, it's it's hard for me to judge them, even though they were deists, even though they were, you know, that had the, the, the Masonic under underpinnings. And I know a lot of people, even to this day, don't want to venerate a Jefferson or or some of the other founding fathers because hey, they were they were slaveholders. That just happened to be common at that time. Well, even today it seems there's a, a movement of uh people. It's been in the news lately, yeah, for example, in Florida to uh, sort of uh, teach young people in school that, well, slavery had its positive side. People learned trades when they were uh, slaves. Uh, it, it, I'm under the impression that a lot of what we're experiencing t these days in terms of political turmoil are, are the residues from the Civil War that are still unresolved. Well, think about it for a minute. You had uh, 250 years of slavery here, right? Uh, from the 1600s to the, the mid 19th uh, century. And then despite reconstruction and the best attempts by Lincoln and then Ulysses S. Grant to get rid of all of that, um, reconstruction failed. And we had a hundred years of Jim Crow. Now, was Jim Crow as bad as slavery? No, but there were still lynchings going on. We still had apartheid, uh, black people, Negroes, uh, as, as we use that term at that time, we're second-class citizens. Now we've entered a phase, which is lighter still, where there's still the vestiges of systemic racism. I know some people would disagree with that. However, the statistics, and again, I'm looking at it from a legal standpoint. We covered this on the American Law Journal quite a bit. If you looked at you know, the, amount, the, the number of people arrested for, let's say, marijuana possession in the early 2000s, Black people were four times as likely to get arrested for that than white people. And yet Black people smoked marijuana no more nor less percentage-wise than white people. So there are still some vestiges of racism. I mean, look what the iPhone and VHS cameras have shown us in the late 20th and 21st century. Some of that is evidence, prima facie evidence on its case that we still have racism. Now, is it slowly bleeding out of the system? 
yeah, I, th I think at some point in time, we will reach that. Are we there yet? I don't believe we are. Some Justice Roberts would disagree with me. But at the same time, I think this is, and this is the strength behind ecumenism and mysticism and, and you know, meeting at the mountaintop, that all of a sudden we realize, okay, you know, I've probably spent lifetimes as a woman, as a black person, as, you know, a Native American, an Aboriginal person. I mean, once I get over the fact that maybe in this lifetime in a male heterosexual, you know, born Christian um, body, that... Um, that that's not all that's that's to me my my entire lifetimes my soul is much broader than that beautifully put uh, suzanne taylor uh, has another question uh, she writes one of the most transformative things we could do is demote jesus from being a God to being a great teacher. So we learn from him instead of worship him. Do you, what are your thoughts on that proposition? I've got a segment in my book called Jesus is Just All Right. And I could give it as a pop quiz, but um, the cat's out of the bag. But basically, you know, what does Gandhi, Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King, Thomas Jefferson, and Bill Maher all have in common? The answer is they all thought that Jesus was the greatest moral teacher that humanity has ever known. So you've got an atheist, you've got a, a, a Hindu, uh, you've got a, a deist, etc. Uh, and you've got a, a Christian such as Howard Thurman, all believing that Jesus was the greatest teacher that we've ever known. In fact, Gandhi said, if he was ever jettisoned on a, on a desert island, if he didn't have the, you know, the Gita, uh, the Beatitudes would be wonderful. You know, and that's where Thomas Jefferson got into trouble. And people called him an atheist because he said, you know, I don't know if Jesus is the son of God. Now, maybe today he might have seen it differently. Maybe he would have said, well, you know what? Jesus was the son of God. But guess what? We all are. And, uh, you know, I think that you can either we can either demote Jesus down from the, uh, you know, the only son of God, or we can promote ourselves up as the sons and daughters of God, divinity in utero, if you will. And that maybe if Jefferson was alive today, he might say, well, we're all on the same plane. I mean, this is what got him in trouble. It's what got Ralph Waldo Emerson in, in trouble. He stepped up on the stage at Harvard in the late 1830s. And he basically, you know, they asked him because he had graduated from the Harvard Divinity School. And uh, they had asked him, well, what's, what, what's the clergy going to be really cha challenged with in the next generation? And basically he was telling you, he was telling them, if you start seeing any difference between yourself and Jesus, you're on the wrong track. And of course, they didn't ask him back to Harvard for another 30 years. I mean, here was a man who was, who was too liberal for Unitarianism. Go figure. So we can either be elevated to Jesus' status or Jesus is. But, but again, and, and th this is the great wisdom from the Edgar Cayce readings. I mean, this is part of the division between historic Christianity and esoteric spirituality or Christianity. And I think we're moving more towards the direction where Mr. Casey was, where, where Casey talked about the previous lives of Jesus the Christ. Well, that's heresy, folks, even 100 years or 75 years after Mr. Casey's death. But I think we are moving in that direction. Again, ecumenism, mysticism, the convergence of these various belief systems are going to start seeing Jesus for what maybe I or Jeff or Emmy might see Jesus as, which is the great teacher. And this is part of the new thought movement. They see Jesus as the great example, not the great exception. Well, there's another vision of Jesus, and you touched on it. You alluded to it briefly in our discussion of Teilhard de Chardin, uh, in which you said he talked about the cosmic Christ. Uh, and I know Matthew Fox, uh, who you mentioned almost in the same breath, uh, wrote a book called The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. How, how do you reconcile or what is your understanding of the cosmic Christ? Well, one of the favorite uh, lines I've heard, I think, was out of Richard Rohr's group, which is the Center for Action and Contemplation, maybe from somewhere else, is that we didn't know that Jesus wasn't, uh, that Christ wasn't his last name. <laughs> and, you know, there has been that notion that uh, Jesus and Christ is one, and, and those are the only two words that go together. I remember early on uh, being exposed again to Casey and metaphysics, and I thought, it, it took me aback, you know, even at that age, it was like, 
well, there's Jesus the Christ, but then there's Bill the Christ and Mary the Christ and Emmy the Christ and Jeff the Christ. And so I think it's a greater understanding of what does the word Christ means. It's a venerated station. It's a, it's a state of awareness. It's a state of consciousness. And I think that Jesus's divinity is something that he has always said to humanity, as Casey himself said, all these things I can do, you can do. Um, the Aquarian gospel of Jesus the Christ, which I'm hoping to uh, talk about in one of my, uh, my interviews, which was written in the mid-19th century, talks about, you know, the Christ is what Jesus became, what all men can become, what all men and women will become. So perhaps that's that's part of that evolution. We shouldn't make a distinction between Jesus and Christ any more than ourselves and Christ. Well said. We have just 10 minutes left. <laughs> so people know. Let, let me pursue one other issue uh, th that we've touched upon uh, with uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, there is a question here from one of our viewers uh, named Antara, whose YouTube name is Antara, who asked, did Chardin foresee transhumanism? And I presume that uh, we're talking now about transhumanism in what I might regard, and certainly my guest James Tunney would regard as a negative sense, the idea that someday we will all upload our consciousness into computers and we will become perfected as uh, silicon beings of, of, of some sort. And uh, there is this sense when you talk about he anticipated the internet, that, you know, the internet is what we can think of as global consciousness. Uh, in a sense, the internet is like a global brain, but in another sense, one needs to ask, well, you know, where is the soul in the internet? And uh, are we missing something? And, and did Chardin take a, a wrong turn somewhere by uh, advocating all of uh, this technology? If you're asking me, uh, Jeff, I would just yeah. say, again, uh, Chardin, you know, he, he called it a new sphere, a planetary sphere of thought and reason, which encompasses the earth. And this is what emerges through evolution. Um, but at the same time, Chardin never lost sight of what we ultimately were, and that is we are love. And I think that no matter, you know, we can talk about the new sphere and the omega point, but if we are not evolving through the heart chakra, then we're not evolving. And, and so when I hear the notions that maybe Chardin missed it, because we're equating the newest fear to the internet, let's say, um, it's for the same reason that people believe that, uh, some people believe that AI will never uh, supplant humanity. And why is that? Because meaningful choice based on the wisdom of the heart is not something that a machine can do. It can examine probabilities. And I certainly don't think that that's what Chardin foresaw. I just certainly don't believe that he thought that, you know, the cosmic Christ, the, the coming of the cosmic Christ was anything less than the full loving expression of the man Jesus himself and what he represented. That's kind of my view as, as well. And it's, I suppose, a, a little point of contention between uh, myself and uh, James Tunney, but who, who is a warning. I mean, he, he is a prophet of the uh, negative side of uh, science and technology and, and the vision of the human being as no more than a very sophisticated machine. Interesting. I, I haven't uh, gotten that from uh, listening to James yet there. I know that there are probably another 35 uh, interviews that I need to catch up on. <laughs> Hard to keep up with Jeffrey Mishlove <laughs> and James. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's probably the central uh, theme in uh, the last uh, three or four books that he's written is uh, the, the dangers of scientism the the day particularly the the dangers of uh, human beings giving up their autonomy uh, for 
or their sovereignty, I think is the word he likes to use. And in the service of uh, some greater machine that will uh, take us over and make life better for everyone. Well, yeah, artificial intelligence, I think, is one of the grave dangers. And I, I, I don't write about that so much in, in my book. But if you talk about awakening catalyst, and I really focused on authoritarianism and climate change, but you really could put, um, you know, um, COVID-like diseases, you could put AI in there. Um, we can, and I know you talk about it as well, uh, awakening catalyst could also be extraterrestrial intelligence, which I think is going to be a big, big part of that. And one of the reasons I'm really so excited to be, you know, associated with the program, because you folks and Jeff, you have dug so deeply into, into extraterrestrial intelligence and speaking about it in an intelligent, sober manner, because it's so easy to parody this. Um, and, and again, watching uh, some of the work, Skinwalker Ranch uh, and uh, Ancient Aliens. And it's funny, I used to even eschew some of those programs and, and create distance because I felt like, well, the, the, the discussion about them was almost cartoonish, um, absurd, uh, easy to make jokes about. But now that we find that the government is disgorging information that demonstrates this stuff is very real. We don't understand it, but this stuff is very real. There's now that resistance and that that absurdity that was associated with this is now starting to fall away. And one of the things I've learned by from listening and watching your program, Jeff, and it struck me when you said this, I maybe listened to this about a month or two ago, where you said something to this effect, where the emergence of UAPs and UFOs and the serious study of who they are, what they represent, and what they mean to us, is immersed in psi phenomena, extra physical, metaphysical, mystical understanding. And I, and I had to, it took a little while for me to wrap my head around it, but how inextricably entwined they are. Yeah. And I'm starting to see this in my own life. But now that the resistance to UAPs and UFOs is beginning to drop because, hey, this stuff is real and we've got the evidence for it both what the government is revealing and then what, uh, you know, individual groups have, have been doing, citizens groups have been doing, that now the resistance is starting to drop away. And I think the same sort of phenomena has got to occur in the psi phenomena, parapsychological field. And again, I write about it a little bit because we see these convergence of belief systems. Some of this stuff you cannot deny. Some of the work they're doing up here at University of Virginia, three hours up the road from us here, I mean, when you start to look what Bruce Grayson and Jim Tucker uh, working on Ian Stevenson's work, how could you not sit there and say, well, there's no way that reincarnation is real. Yeah, you don't have proof for that. Yeah, I, you didn't prove it in a laboratory. No, we haven't. But the circumstantial evidence, we don't have a, you know, we don't have direct evidence. We don't have fingerprints on the knife. But the circumstantial evidence is so overwhelming. You at least have to start questioning your answers which is part of what this is, is all about. Well, Christopher, I'm so excited to have you join our team. I know we're going to have many, many interesting discussions in, in the future. We're very close to the bottom of the hour. So I would like to remind our viewers uh, once again about our free weekly newsletter. You can subscribe to it on the New Thinking Aloud foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org, as well as our free quarterly magazine and the um, New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series, where we've just released our first book on Is There Life After Death? The second book in the series is now in preparation, and it will be dealing with the question of extraterrestrial intelligence. Do you have a, a, a final thought, uh, Christopher, for our viewers? Or Emmy, do you? Yeah, Emmy, please. Well, I just want to say that it's been so much fun to be here with both of you. And our conversations will definitely continue because there's so many amazing places to continue to go with all of this. Uh, my question really in the last minute here is just for Jeff, if you have any thoughts for Christopher or myself as we go forward, all hosting New Thinking Aloud together. All I can say is I'm very grateful for both of you. Likewise. 
Okay, Christopher, do you have a thank you, Jeff? Do you have any thoughts you want to share with the audience? I'm just happy. I'm very, very happy to be here. This um, this has worked out organically. And as I said at the very top, I think it's kind of an answer to prayer. I'll get into some of some of my background at, at some future point um, and how I got here. But really, this has kind of shown up very organically. And uh, so, Jeff, whatever prompted you to extend the offer to me, I I, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm here. And, you know, um, I will give it 110%. I know I'm supposed to be here. That's very clear. My intuition has told me that, Emmy. See, I just know that I'm supposed to be here working with both of you. You're both delights. You're both wise. And I, I couldn't think of... Uh, you know, two, two team players to be working with uh, more than you folks. And I'm looking forward to meeting the other volunteers as well. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, for those of you who have been watching or listening to this live stream or to the archive video, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. Bye for now, everybody.